bow our heads in prayer. Lord, through the written word and the spoken word, may we now meet the living word. Amen. And so today we come to the last Sunday in Advent. Christmas is just around the corner and we come with joy, looking forward to Christmas, but then again the coming of Christ at the end of all time. And though our theme is joy, it seems at first sight a little strange that neither of the lead readings directly relate to joy. In fact, one could say almost the opposite. Ahaz is king under very difficult circumstances. He has the Syrians and the, um, and the northern kingdom declaring war on him because he will not join an alliance with them against Assyria. And he is threatened with invasion. And Isaiah comes to him and says to him, you have nothing to worry about. Trust God. In fact, the last words before the reading we picked up on this morning are wonderful words because they say, if you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. That's what Isaiah is saying. Trust God. And then in today's reading, we move a step further where Isaiah comes, impelled by the Spirit of God, and says, ask for a sign. Ask me, God, to give you a sign that all will be well. And we have those wonderful words from Ahaz, from Ahaz I will not ask for a sign. Wonderful piety. Or is it? Because God does not seem to treat it as such. And Isaiah says something Quite, power, quite frightening almost. He says, is it not enough that you weary the hearts of men? Must you also weary the heart of God? So quite clearly, in Isaiah's perspective and from God's perspective, that humility is no humility at all. Because it's disobedience. It's disobedience to what God has just told him to do. God says, do this, and he says, no. But there's actually another deeper reason which might explain why Isaiah says, is, is it not enough that you weary men? Must you weary the heart of my God too? My God, perhaps not your God. Eh? So why? Well, the answer lies in the fact that having been told by Isaiah to trust God, Ahaz has gone off to protect himself in real politic terms. He's made an alliance to God against the invasion of Syria and Israel. And the alliance he's made is with, with Assyria the greatest threat of all. He voluntarily makes himself a vassal under the protection of Syria and pays Syria tribute. So now he is part of Assyria and protected. But actually, what he's done will spell the death knell for Syria and for the northern kingdom of Israel, and ultimately for the southern kingdom of which he is king as well. In other words, his disobedience, his refusal to trust God, means he will fall, and he will take others down with him. 
because he will not give himself to God. When we come to the New Testament, the gospel story, we have a very different situation, but one at one level, not all that much different. Joseph is struggling. He is in a crisis. His whole world has fallen apart. The woman to which he was betrothed has fallen pregnant. And that is a scandal beyond scandals in the ancient world. The Jewish law required or prescribed that she should be put to death. But we're told that Joseph, being an honorable man, did not want to do that. And he resolved to put her away quietly. And it's in the midst of that that the angel comes to 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 Joseph in a dream and challenges Joseph. Do not be afraid. Take this woman to be your wife. Now, before I go any further in it, I just need to make a comment that the two stories are actually parallel stories around the identical prophecy. Because the prophecy given to Ahaz is the prophecy of a virgin conceiving, whose name will be Emmanuel, God with us. And it's the fulfillment of that prophecy in messianic terms that takes place when Gabriel comes to Mary. And so what Joseph is being confronted with is the fulfillment of that prophecy. Two men being asked to respond in trust to God. The one responds, the other doesn't. Joseph takes Mary because he has heard the word of the Lord. It's hard to imagine that he took her with joy. But perhaps there was a sense of joy that, yes, even through this difficult moment, God is at work. And you see, I think that's really at the heart of what both readings are talking about. We live in a world that can be troubled. It can be troubled on the global scale. It can be troubled on the national scale. It can be troubled in our own individual lives. Things aren't always going the way we want them to go or we, the way we think they should go. But the story of uh, both sets of stories make it abundantly clear. God is at work. God has a plan. And that plan is not the plan that the world would think. Ahaz is very clear. As king, he knows what good politics is and how to work these things. And he's completely wrong. He brings down destruction upon himself, upon his neighbors. God's way is a different way. And it starts with, if you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. The same thing applies here to Joseph. Trust God. And so Joseph hesitantly perhaps, obeys, and he takes the woman to be his wife. And the child is born, the child is received, and God's salvation plan can go forward. I want to end just with one last comment, because I think it follows on quite a bit on what David was saying in the sermon last week. It's interesting that when God breaks into our world, he doesn't do it as Ahaz would have liked, with signs of power and wonder, with might and destruction. When God comes to us, he comes in the person of a baby, completely unthreatening, no danger whatsoever. God empties himself to come to us. God gives himself in weakness to us. 
but it is, an, it is an accepting the God who pours himself out to us that the purposes of God can be fulfilled. And so the, the prophecy of the virgin conceiving is both a message of joy, but it is also a warning. Hear the word of the Lord, respond to it. Respond to Jesus as he comes at Christmas and be ready to receive him when he comes again in glory.